So just to set the scene and context uh, for our discussion with our panel, you could say that in broad terms, there are two types of nature related activism or engagement. The first protects nature for its use or benefit to humans. The second treats nature as a fully actualized power in its own right, which humans are part of. So we're going to be exploring those two approaches. And I want to flag um, right from the start that we're going to be um, focusing on the non-animate world. The rights of other than human animals is just not something we can do justice to in this session. And hopefully maybe we can come back to that at a, at a different event. So for most of our time on this planet, humans have understood nature as a living force on which we depend and which is worthy of our respect and even reverence. Our festivals and agricultural cycles were based on the seasons and the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars. And modern science also confirms that we are part of an integrated living earth system and within a wider, wider cosmos. However, in the Western world, particular philosophies and ways of living have encouraged a view of nature as separate from humans, and as we've discussed in previous sessions, existing as mainly for the use for particular members of human society. So cultures and traditions originally in Europe, which had a different view, were gradually destroyed, and that violence spread through the rest of the world through colonialism. And we then had capitalist models of extraction, which again, um, pushed beyond uh, growth, be sought growth beyond natural limits um, and impacted on marginalized and excluded members of society as we discussed last week. So through that we've seen ills such as species extinction and disastrous climate change and massive biodiversity loss, um, animal cruelty and the diseases that we're seeing that come from ecosystem destruction, um, to name just a few. So there remain many cultures, however, where the relationship between humans and nature has not been severed. So these include in particular indigenous cultures, um, the rights of Mother Earth or Pachamama, is, as nature is known in that part of the world, are included in the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia. In Ecuador, rights of nature cases have protected the Vilcabamba River from development by reaffirming its right to take a particular course. And they've also protected the Galapagos Islands. And there was a recent climate case in Colombia where the court held that the, the Amazon had, its, had legal rights in its own, um, uh, to itself in its own right, and that the government had a duty to protect it. Living traditions such as Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism emphasize the sanctity of all life. And India's constitution refers to respect for every form of life, regardless of its worth to humans. New Zealand has passed legislation making the river Wahangangri a legal person represented by members of the Maori community as well as the government. Nepal is reported to be considering legal protection of the right of the Himalayas to exist as mountains. Communities in America have right, enacted rights of nature law and the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma was the first tribal nation in the US to have a rights of nature statute. And with Carlotta in our, on our panel, we will be discussing African Earth jurisprudence. However, there's still a very long way to go. There's no basic acceptance of nature having self-standing rights in many powerful societies. There was an American case relating to the rights of the Colorado River to exist, and it was withdrawn because the government was, the claimant was threatened with costs for bringing a vexatious or pointless or aggravating case, is another way of describing it, by the government. <clears throat> rights of nature have also been weighed in the balance against human, social and economic interests, rather than overriding them. They haven't stopped the push by extractive industries into indigenous territories. And nature would also have to be represented by human beings in the human legal world. And that might work, for example, if there was a community with, the, with a deep connection to the natural site concerned, but how would it work if it was a state body that also had responsibility for issuing mining consents, for example, or dam building? So a case giving the Yamuna and Ganga or Ganges rivers legal status was overturned by the Indian Supreme Court. Litigation was the culmination of years of struggle between local communities who worship these mighty rivers as goddesses, relying on them for sustenance and the competing drive for Western style economic growth. So there are divergences with Western style conservation approaches here too. If the river is a goddess, some argue, she remains the one with the agency to protect humans, not the other way around. So those supporting nature rights argue that a society that had them would evolve along better lines than one that didn't. It would be harder to destroy plants and animals if they could be protected in their own right, in the same way as companies are protected 
despite not being human either. But do we need to be wary of putting humans back at the top of the planetary pyramid, even in the guise of protectors? Do humans in Western and Westernized societies need to come back into right relationship with our place as part of nature in philosophical, cultural, and even spiritual terms before we can look to the law and economic systems to support this? And are we seeing signs of a reorientation towards nature in such societies? So it's clear that re-establishing a harmonious relationship with nature has never been more important or precarious. And I'm delighted to be discussing the challenges and pleasures of doing this with our multifaceted, multi-talented inspirational panel this evening, which is made up of Carlotta Byrne, the Earth Jurisprudence Coordinator at the Gaia Foundation and former food grower, course facilitator and solicitor, Laura Guark, singer, former, performer, composer, and workshop leader at arts company Convex. Paul Palsland, civil barrister, environmental activist, storyteller, and founder of Lawyers for Nature. And Shivali Fulchand, junior doctor, editor and coordinator of the Year of Climate Change at the British Medical Journal, and London project coordinator of the Boomi or Earth Project. So first of all, a very warm welcome to our panel. It's wonderful to have you here. And I'd like you to each uh, one by one, perhaps explain a little bit about the work that you do um, and your interest in this topic. So if I could start off in the order that I introduced you with uh, Carlotta first, please. Sure, thank you, Gita. And it's a pleasure to be with everybody this evening. Um, so as Gita said, I coordinate the Earth Jurisprudence Programme at the Gaia Foundation. And for those who don't yet know the Gaia Foundation, we're an NGO based in the UK. We work internationally. And over the past 35 years, the Gaia Foundation has worked with a global network to revive biocultural diversity, to regenerate healthy ecosystems, and to restore a respectful relationship with and love for Mother Earth. And much of the work that we do is with traditional and indigenous communities to revive their Earth-centered traditions, their customary governance systems, and to protect their sacred natural sites. Um, the philosophy that underpins uh, the work that we do is Earth Jurisprudence, which I'll say more about shortly. Um, and as part of our work on Earth Jurisprudence, or EJ, as I will refer to it interchangeably, as Earth Jurisprudence can be a bit of a mouthful. Um, as part of our work on EJ, one of the global networks that we work with is the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, of which we're a founding member. So through our EJ programme, we work with communities and civil society in several countries in Africa um, to strengthen an African Earth Jurisprudence movement, as well as collaborating with an international movement for the recognition of Earth-centred law. And we also deliver a three-year training programme on various aspects of Earth Jurisprudence to a network of civil society leaders in Africa that, through the process, graduate as Earth Jurisprudence practitioners and most often go on to accompany indigenous communities in the revival of their customary governance. Now, whilst Rights to Nature will be familiar in some shade or degree for, for most listening this evening, Earth jurisprudence may not be. Um, it's a term that was conceived of by an eco-theologian, Thomas Berry, around the turn of this century, and it began as a radical philosophy of law and governance, calling for a transformation of our consciousness and our institutions from a human-centred to an earth-centred paradigm. So from a relationship of exploitation with the natural world conceived of as property, resource, commodity for human use, um, to a mutually enhancing and respectful human-earth relationship in which the inherent value and rights of each member of the earth community are recognised. So this is what Thomas Berry understood to be the great work of our time to make this seismic transition. And so Earth Jurisprudence is broad in its vision. It's about systemic transformation of law, but also economics, education, politics, so that all of our social systems safeguard the integrity and well-being of the Earth as a whole, rather than serving the economic interests of a single species at great ecological cost to the planet. And this philosophy is the basis of a vibrant Earth Jurisprudence movement that has been growing over the past 20 years, predominantly focusing on law and described in the latest UN Harmony with Nature report as the fastest growing legal movement of the 21st century. And how does it relate to rights of nature? Well, EJ is the underpinning philosophy of much of the rights of nature legislation and court decisions that 
Peter has referenced in her introduction um, that have been particularly emerging over the past decade. And one of the key principles of Earth jurisprudence is that every member of the Earth community, whether a living being or a component of an ecosystem, has three inherent rights, the right to be, the right to habitat, and the right to fulfill its role in the ever-renewing processes of the Earth. And these rights are not equivalent to human rights, they're species or role-specific, and they ensure that each constituent member of our living Earth is able to perform its unique role, which is understood to be integral to the well-being of the planet as a whole. And most legal systems, as we'll go on to explore, I'm sure, are human-centred, so they recognise humans and human-governed organisations as sole central subjects of law, they serve human interests with limited regards for wider ecological realities and with total blindness to humans' interdependence with the wider web of life. And rights and nature mechanisms, by contrast, they decenter the human. They resituate us as a rights-bearing subject of law, among many others in the natural world. So rights and nature is part of this earth-centered paradigm that EJ is seeking to catalyze. And just to close now, um, I want to comment that as well as the rights of nature, there are other forms of earth-centered law. So many of you will be familiar with ecocide. And another example are the laws and governance systems of indigenous peoples. Um, and very briefly, these ind indigenous laws have governed communities over generations, sometimes since time immemorial. They predate our state laws by many centuries and they guide communities to live in respectful relationship with the wider earth community and to acknowledge responsibility to that ecosystem as well as balancing human interests against those of the legal, local ecosystem. So these laws don't expressly use the language of the rights of nature because rights are a western legal concept but recognition of the rights of nature is inherent within these laws um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, that's a very reassuring to hear that this is the fastest growing legal movement in the 21st century. So that's mm -hmm. a positive way to start. Laura, if you'd like to follow. Yes. Hi, everyone. And thank you uh, for inviting me. I am a performance leader, singer and composer, as Gita mentioned. Uh, I could direct the artistic company Convex with Sara, uh, my colleague Sara Lekangsang, which is also on the call with us. Um, at Convex, we create um, collective experiences that give threatened environments a voice with the aim to provoke thoughtful awareness on these threatened environments and our relationship with them. Um, in our events, what happens is that people come together in a place, they take part in an experience that usually includes elements of walking and promenades articulated on that place and elements of immersive singing, uh, sonic art uh, also articulated in that place. And um, one of the, the pieces, the performances that we created recently um, was um, Talwek, um, which was a participatory uh, performance about river rights and connection, connection to nature that we um, articulated along the River Thames in Rotherhide and presented that Totally Thames 2019. Great, thanks, Laura. And it's wonderful to have you here to bring in um, the wider sense of the different ways that we can connect. And it'll be really wonderful to hear a bit more about the work that you did with Thalweg and engaging with community relationships with the river. So I'm looking forward to hearing that a little bit later on. Um, next, uh, we have Paul, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so a little part of history of how I became involved in the rights of nature and advocating for nature. Um, I qualified as an ordinary barrister uh, a decade ago and was just, uh, I guess, interested in a normal law career. Um, and then during my 20s, I very much fell in love with nature um, and with the natural world. And I think I'll be talking about that later on. There's a specific question about that. So I'll save some more details about that for there. Um, and that didn't actually really go across to my legal career very much. I'm not an environmental lawyer. I just do ordinary civil law as part of my day job I'm in my office right now. Um, uh, but I sort of started feeling that that was um, somehow wrong. It was uncomfortable that I had this deep love for nature in my private life and in some of my activism, but I wasn't actually doing that in my job. Um, and so I began to try and look for ways to, um, to bring the two together a little bit. Um, and I started with trees, um, partially because I spent quite a lot of time planting trees, which, as many of you know, is a lovely thing to do, but also really frustrating because they die really easily. 
um, and mm -hmm. um, they, 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 they planted trees and they don't really, they, a lot of them die, at least in my experience, over half. And actually this, uh, this drought ridden spring has actually caused the majority of the trees I planted to die, which is really sad. And that made me think, well, actually, like, you know, nature's already planted a lot of these trees and they do, the ones that are already planted are doing really well. So maybe as well as planting them, we should, you know, look after the ones we already have and stop chopping them down as a, as a bare minimum. Um, so that's, I started looking into that and I basically just went on a Facebook group, um, like a tree lovers Facebook group and posted if anyone knew of a group for lawyers to give their time free to protect trees, presuming there would be such a group. Uh, and it turns out there wasn't. Um, it's, and it's been a constant surprising journey of how little lawyers are actually involved in this stuff a lot of the time. Um, but someone directed me to um, Sheffield and said, have you checked out what's happening in Sheffield? And I hadn't uh, heard of that. Um, but as many of you know, that was the biggest, uh, one of the biggest grassroots environmental um, campaigns of the past decade in which local people were trying to stop 17,000 of their mature street trees being chopped down. Um, and I contacted uh, the people involved in the Sheffield dispute and they said, thank God you've uh, contacted us. Um, we need uh, an advice from a QC who's a specialist in trade union law by the end of the weekend or the whole campaign is over and we're going to lose the trees. And I was like, well, I'm not a QC. That's like a very senior lawyer. Uh, and I have no idea about the area of law and I'm going on holiday tonight, but I'll do my best. Um, and so in, in the evenings while I was on holiday, uh, I wrote them this advice and they handed it to the police on Monday morning and the police stopped arresting people standing under the trees and the campaign carried on from there. Um, and there's a specific tree up in Sheffield called the owl tree, um, which was the final tree, the next tree due to be chopped down on that morning. And it's still there. And it's one of my favorite trees in the world as a result. And I've been to see it a few times. Um, and that was a wonderful feeling. I don't think I, I may be, that may be my peak of my career. I don't know, because you rarely get that as a lawyer. Um, uh, normally with law, even if you're right, you hand over an advice and the police basically throw it in the bin and carry on doing what they're doing. That they actually listened and it actually made a difference is incredible. And um, yeah, so I, I then spent two years um, representing and advising the Sheffield tree, tree protesters. And eventually, of course, they won. And I'll be talking about that a little bit further on as well. Um, and that really made me realize that there's a, a real lack of a legal legal support for ordinary people who are taking direct action to protect nature. There's amazing organizations like Client Earth um, and Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace doing a lot of stuff, but actually in terms of protect, representing lo local people who are often trying to save their own nature, there's very little. So I set up Lawyers for Nature to offer that support. So the sort of tagline for Lawyers for Nature is um, uh, representing, sorry, representing the natural world and all who seek to defend it. Um, so yeah and i also uh, helped set up lawyers for extinction rebellion last year um and in my own personal time i do a lot of nature related projects kind of trying to um contrast the kind of heady office -y legal stuff with a bit of practical um nature protection so i set up the river roading project in east london um which is a community boat project to restore the river and try and maybe get it some rights as well um and our facebook is friends of the river roading for that and I'll be again talking about that as an example during my talk later. Great, thanks so much, Paul, and for articulating that that journey between uh, aligning what your personal interests and passions are with with a world that's very much oriented, particularly in the law, towards a particular way of doing things, and how how you've managed to marry those two together. So that's great, uh, Shivali. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, it would be a pleasure to be here with um, such an amazing and inspiring panel of speakers. Um, so I'm a doctor in training, um, but I've taken a year out this year to work as an editor um, at the British Medical Journal. And um, I suppose unexpectedly, I uh, probably picked one of the most interesting and challenging years um, of our generation to be pursuing something like this. Um, I guess at medical school, I, I suppose I couldn't decide which human organ I, I like the most. So I could never really commit to a specialty. Um, I just knew that the NHS wasn't coping with the demand at the time and that led to often poor levels of care being provided. Um, and one of the things that we learnt early on is that a key indicator of our quality of life is the life expectancy. Now in London, if you compare the life expectancy between two areas, um, between Marble Arch and Whitechapel, just a few stops away, the life expectancy falls by around 20 years. This was significant for me and it kind of made me realise there's bigger factors at play that's influencing health rather than just what we're doing in the hospital. And doctors are often on the kind of receiving line of this and they're treating the consequence of poor prevention strategies. So three key areas of interest emerged for me at this time, public and global health, health policy 
and the effective communication of this through scientific literature and journalism. And alongside all of this, of course, the threat of climate change, which um, I was always aware of early on, but it just wasn't taught at medical school at all. Um, so in my spare time, I worked with an international faith-based environmental charity to kind of bridge this gap between the health and environment. With another team, I advocated for river rights in India and um, one river in particular, the Yamuna River. And the, the Yamuna is probably the most polluted river in India at the moment and one statistic shows that 23% of children living along this river have lethal levels of lead in their blood causing all sorts of problems including neurological deficits. So the relationship between health and environment is deeply connected and it's heavily emphasized through many spiritual traditions but it's often omitted from the medical conversations that I was having but now we're seeing that increasing rec recognition is being given. Um, another medical journal, The Lancet, um, is pretty vocal about this as well and calls climate the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. Um, and one of the most pressing global health issues of our generation is the state of our environment and climate change. And through this, I was given the opportunity to lead um, at the British Medical Journal our year of climate change as COP26 was meant to be held this year. Obviously, it's been delayed to next year now. But still, we're carrying on our efforts, and we had threefold changes that we implemented within our organization. First, changes in the way we work as an organization, our national strategy, and also our communication with doctors and policymakers. We launched a divestment campaign for health organizations to move away from fossil fuel investments. Um, we advocated government on behalf of health and climate issues. And most importantly, um, we present analyses and science linking the health, healing health climate. Um, Interestingly, the impact on human health of climate change is often overlooked. When I go to press conferences on climate change, journalists are often surprised that someone from a medical journal is there. Um, however, health professionals like myself, I believe, are uniquely placed as we are the ones that will be treating the effects of us mistreating the environment. Um, and we have a scientific background to support this kind of evidence-based approach. Unfortunately, the work that we do in the hospital is also leading to a large amount of pollution. Healthcare's emissions globally is 4.4%, which is not much lower than aviation. If healthcare was a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter in the world. So we have a dual responsibility um, to patients and also to society at large. And um, we've seen from this pandemic that our relationship to nature can't be ignored. And as doctors and scientists, we must support the effort to create the necessary paradigm shifts to facilitate these changes. Um, and so this is where I'm trying to contribute in my work. Great, thanks so much, Shivali, and thanks for speaking to that, that compartmentalization issue where one uh, area is looked at in isolation from another and the connection between climate change or um, inequality and health impacts is, isn't being recognized. So that's really amazing you're doing work in that, in that area. Um, so uh, I think that, that's, that's super key and really wonderful to have your, your expertise here. And as you say, it's, it is the medical staff, as we're seeing now, the carers that are, that are dealing with the consequences of, of these decisions made further down in different systems. And so it's great to have you with us. So now I'm going to move into our um, specific questions to panellists. So, Paul, um, would you say it's possible to solve something uh, to environmental problems or climate change without having rights of nature? Um, I think fundamentally, the, the, the way that the law views nature as a property and a resource for uh, humans use only is leading us to our own destruction. And I don't think it is very feasible to uh, solve the ecological or the climate crisis without addressing that fundamental issue at the root of it. But also, I would say... Um, I, I kind of agree with the, the idea of Charles Eisenstein that actually it may in fact be possible um, to carve out some kind of future for humanity where we don't align with nature, where we you know, live in sort of um, technology bubbles uh, surrounded by concrete and everything um, denatured. We, we may be able to survive like that uh, in a technical sense, but will we actually want to? And so I think it's almost certain to say that if, if we want to survive the current crisis, uh, in a way that is also um, keeps our souls, I think, and keeps us in alignment with the way that humans, I think, truly want to be, then it has to involve some addressing of the rights of nature. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, sorry, carry on. 
No, no, I, I, are you going to pose the next question? <laughs> uh, oh, no, I was just uh, in response to what you just said there was uh, we um, spoke last week in terms of the climate. We looked at very much at climate justice um, and even even responding to that Charles Eisenstein opinion. I mean, a certain part of society perhaps could manage that, but had access to technology and a certain, a certain mm. level of resource. But if you look at the global population, that really wouldn't be possible and also it yes yeah, so you can you can look at solutions through the lens of okay this is a small specific group of people and then nature um people who don't fall within that group people who are impacted in the way shivali was talking about just don't even form part of of the equation so mm -hmm. that's just going to be my observation mm -hmm. but but do carry on yeah and I was, I was just going to sort of talk about the kind of original sin i suppose of law um and um particularly in relation to english law because actually so many of the problems that we now see in the world have been exported um through colonialism through the legal system from england and actually very specifically from a certain very small part of england as well um i was actually writing an article for um the uh, an organization called Middle Temple, which is one of the four barristers' inns of courts, which I'm a member of, um, and a guy called uh, Blackstone, uh, who was a member there, where he wrote the first textbook on English law, and many of his ideals have permeated out into the world through the common law system and through um, being forced upon people by uh, English colonialism. Um, and he originally came up with the idea of property and what gives property rights, and he said, the earth, therefore, and all things therein are the general property of all mankind, exclusive of other beings from the immediate gift of the creator. So it's a very Christian biblical view of nature as a as property and resource. And, and it's this idea which we have spread around, which has possibly been one of the most poisonous and um, appalling that, it, that we have done in this, in this legal system, actually. Uh, this is at the root of so many other problems. Um, and uh, that's, I suppose, um, and I, I'm going to talk in this talk particularly about English system because it's the one I know best about. But obviously, um, I think it's worth bearing in mind the effect that our um, jurisprudence and the basis of that has had on other peoples around the world. Um, so in, in England, the problem we have really at the moment is um, that by not giving rights to nature, um, any lawyer that wants to advocate for nature is constantly having their um advocacy with that with one hand tied behind their back actually in many ways both hands tied behind their back um uh when i was advocating for the sheffield tree protesters um i was often having to make my arguments through the prism of human rights uh so saying oh well we know we we must allow them to stack what, what people were doing effectively was um standing under trees that were being about to be chopped down to try and stop that and the law was saying well you can't stand under the trees and i was saying well under uh article 10 of the human rights that they've got a right to freedom of speech and blah 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 and the judge was like well why don't they exercise that right just away from the tree then and of course the whole thing was rubbish because it wasn't about their freedom of speech at all they didn't give monkeys about the human rights act or any freedom of speech it was to do they wanted to save that trick but of course there's no right in english law for that the Highways Act said it could go. There's no general right to not chop a tree down in English law. The trees themselves have no rights. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and that fundamental issue caused um, a huge loss of trees in Sheffield. But as I'll be going on to later, um, people power in many ways saves the day. Um, another example with trees is, is what's called tree preservation orders, um, which is the only form of protection we really have for trees in the English legal system. And they are not given out just generally to trees. And they're not even given out to trees that are particularly historic or amazing or anything. They're done on amenity values. So what they look like to humans. So you can, there are many ancient trees, particularly uh, in England and Wales. Uh, and there's one in Scotland. Uh, England has some of the most ancient yew trees in the world. So I saw them up to between three to 5,000 years old. They have zero legal protection because they're not covered by the amenity point and we can't get TPOs for them. So someone could chop them down literally tomorrow which is quite incredible when you think about it. Um, and the final thing is, I suppose, is, is the sort of looking at lawyers themselves and the way they approach things. Um, the English legal system is so predicated on defending property rights um, that almost every other interest, including that which is necessary for our own long-term survival, um, falls by the wayside when it comes to those property rights. Um, and even in with law itself, so you have an environmental lawyer. I, I don't describe myself as an environmental lawyer and I don't do environmental law. Uh, it's not some sort of set of rules that I'm applying to nature from humans. Um, it's very interesting. If you Google environmental law barristers, the top set that comes up in, in England is, in, in London is called Landmark. And 
almost without fail, every single time I've been in court trying to protect nature, they've been on the other side. So these environmental lawyers, the ones who want to chop down 17,000 trees in, in Sheffield, want to stop HS2 protesters protecting their trees, and, and on and on and on and on like that. Um, and so I describe myself as a wild lawyer, and I, I like the concept of wild law. And the idea of, I suppose, wild law for me is that it, it's, as a lawyer, I can apply environmental law, but actually my main object is to protect nature, and that can be in whatever way possible. For me and a lot of the time that actually means giving legal advice to um local people who want to um protect and defend their nature um so you've already mentioned um a number of the examples of um around the world where nature has been given rights and the one that's very interesting for me is that i can't, i'm always i was struggling to pronounce it the wahanguini wahanguini river um in new zealand and that's interesting for me because new zealand is a, it's a common law country with a very similar legal system to england and to me the, the crucial the only difference clearly as to why they've got that groundbreaking act of the new zealand parliament that gives rights to the river is because of the strong indigenous voice in, in the form of the maori people um and that is i think for me the thread that seems to run through most examples in the world where when nature has been given rights is that strong indigenous voice so the question is what happens in england and in the uk because we don't have that voice anymore um and just to go in the depressing part of the talk uh, i think the idea that we're going to get any kind of act of parliament from the uk parliament that gives rights to nature in any in the next decade or two decades or frankly in the time it will take us before we destroy ourselves um is very unlikely i, I can't i can't see it happening and, you know, as a lawyer, I get really funny looks when I even go, and I, I don't even go that wild in, in court, you know, I don't even go in there and say trees should have rights, you know, it's like, maybe we should, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I go a lot more conservative than that, but I still get looked at by some just in high court, like I'm just batshit crazy um, for saying we shouldn't destroy our nature. Um, so the whole system, it just seems unlikely that anything's going to happen anytime soon. But um, I also don't want to uh, depress everyone too much. And I want, I find also the idea that uh, everyone else must wait for lawyers or politicians to come up with some kind of um, perfect answer um, to this problem is very disempowering. You know, what, what, what do you all do when you're sitting on this call? You know, to sit there and feel depressed that the UK Parliament's never going to give us an act of Parliament to give rights to nature. And so I just want to also briefly go into the idea of what a right is, because I think we have a very sometimes two dimensional idea of it seeing it just as an act of parliament or something that a, um, that a judge can grant. Um, actually, for me, rights uh, are... Um, uh, can, be very diff can, be, can be lots of different things. And they're not, they're not just based on what is strictly in the law. A right can also be given um, by a sense of uh, power or by direct action, and also by people acting according to that right. Um, so for me, there's a, a great power in the idea of a declaration. So if you declare something and then act as if you believe in that, um, that can have a power. There's also, if you think about it, law is constantly changing according to uh, declaration. So in the American Revolution, a bunch of people got together and said, using violence effectively, like, actually, this is, this is the law we want. I'm not saying we should do violence, but the, obviously the more the tradition we can look for, look to more readily is perhaps the Gandhian tradition of saying, actually, sure, the, you say these are your laws, but actually we think this should be the law uh, and we're going to act on that basis. Um, and actually, if I was to say, if, if the, the, the perfect way forward would be to have an act of parliament with a strong group of people committed and dedicated to upholding that, which is what you see in New Zealand. You've got the Act of Parliament, you've got the Maoris who will enforce it. But if I could have to choose one or the other, so if I either choose just an Act of Parliament that gives rights to nature, or a strong group of committed citizens who want to uphold the rights of nature and to fight to protect and defend nature, I'd definitely choose the latter. Because an Act of Parliament by itself is useless. We've got loads of laws at the moment that are just completely ignored. Um, and there's not, you know, there's, there's, there's trees being chopped down almost every day, probably against TPOs, but because no one doesn't think, no one notices, they get away with it. Um, rivers being polluted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think the Sheffield example for me was the perfect example of, of how rights actually are often more about power than about strictly what the, what the law is.
So in Sheffield, in Sheffield, there was no uh, legal right to save those trees. And actually, I lost every single case I did for them other than that initial advice. So I lost every single case. Um, but they won. And they won because they ultimately, they, they took the rights of Sheffield. They, they, they made up the rights of Sheffield trees, right? They said, no, actually, these trees have a right to be here. They have a right to life. They have a right to exist. And then crucially said, and, and, and you're not taking them. Um, and there's an amazing quote from an environmentalist in the 70s who was really in favour of quite gnarly direct action. And he said, the, uh, for me, the essence of conservation lies in the word no. Say no, mean no, fight to, defend, fight to protect the places we have. And in Sheffield, what happened was they, the police and the council came back harder and harder and harder, getting ever stricter injunctions that basically meant they could put people in prison for standing under a tree. Mm. Um, and every time they did that, what, sorry. No, I was just going to say that's really, um, it's, it's, yeah, really powerful um, explanation. And, it, and also the thing that you've said, which is absolutely key, which is the, the cultural aspect of things and, and how, how do you shift, um, you know, highlighting that the, the systems where things moving move are where people have that connection with nature. And if you're in a system that is very di divorced from that, is it, is it right to be relying on that, um, trying to push the law or, or, or actually creating the community frameworks and, and can that be go first? So I think that's, that's really helpful. I'm just going to move us on bearing in mind where we are mm -hmm. with time, but we'd love to hear more from you in our, if, when we come back as well. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Paul. And I, I'm sure we'll have really lots of, um, I can see already there are questions for you. <laughs> okay. So thanks so much. Um, now um, we're going to be moving on to Carlotta. So what would you say, following on from what Paul's been telling us, has been lost to Western society through the desacralization of nature and, and through, through the experiences of your work? Uh, thanks, Gita, and thanks, Paul. Lots of interesting points raised. Um, yeah, so that's a really big question, Gita. I'm glad you gave me some time to think about it ahead of the discussion. Um, but, but I think it's an interesting one in the context of our discussion on the rights of nature, because most Earth-centred uh, law, as Paul has been saying, is emerging from the grassroots upwards. It's emerging from communities. And in many cases, those communities understand the natural world to be sacred. So if we look to countries with strong national legislation recognising nature as a subject of law, and I'm thinking of New Zealand, which Paul has mentioned, and Ecuador and Bolivia, which you've mentioned, uh, Gita, and, and also Uganda most recently. Uh, these countries, in these countries, indigenous groups and their sacred conception of nature were influential. And for instance, in, in the case of New Zealand, pivotal, the, the law was born out of uh, decades of treaty settlement agreements. Um, so having said that, though, in the US, over 30 municipalities have recognised rights of nature in local legislation. So in the US, there's a recognition that it's not possible to get through a national law, as, as Paul has been saying is the case also in the UK. But there's been lots of community action to get recognition of the rights of nature at, at local level. So I think that that's something that... Um, should be further pursued in in con in contexts where it's not possible to get through law at national level because there's not political will. Um, so, uh, but, but it seems to me that a sense of the sacred often underlies an earth-centered orientation. Um, and and if you understand the world to be sacred, then you're you're attentive to the world around you. Um, you uh, regulate your interactions with the world accordingly and, and you understand yourself to be a small part of something much um, bigger and more mysterious than you can really conceive of. And there's a humility and, and a respect, respect that grows from that world view. Um, and within dominant culture in the West, the prevailing view of the world is as a collection of objects rather than as a communion of subjects, to use Thomas Berry's language. Um, but it's not just in the West. Our global systems are guided by this mechanistic worldview. Um, drawing on the experiences of the African Earth jurisprudence movement, certainly a sense of the sacred is very alive among the communities that are agitating for Earth-centred law at local level, um, even within the context of these global systems that, that say otherwise. And, and this view is really the foundation of the work. So reverence for and intimacy with the natural world is embedded in these communities. It's a living reality. It's alive in their rituals, in their practices, their stories their traditions and their customary laws and this quality of relationship is not something that can be imposed by legislation from the top down 
Um, and I want to draw out that the communities are working with a very different conception um, of law to law as we commonly conceive of it in the West. So this is not state law made up of national and local legislation and court decisions. Um, this is law uh, with a very different origin. So these laws have been passed down orally from generation to generation, sometimes over millennia. They come in the form of myth and song and story. And these uh, communities that our Earth jurisprudence practitioners work with, they look to nature to discern their laws. So these d laws derive from a deep knowledge of the wider ecology and, and a deep relationship with that ecology. Um, and, and some of the communities that our practitioners work with, uh, they have come close to losing these traditions and stories and laws through years of colonialism and marginalization. But this conception of law and this sense of the sacred in nature is something that a community can recover and reintegrate. Um, and so using community processes, our practitioners accompany communities to, to nurture the revival of their earth-centered practices. And um, as part of this process, and, and often over several years, communities will hold intergenerational dialogues, and it's the elders that hold a lot of the memory. And often this journey will begin with a practical focus, so a revival of agroecological farming and a revival of indigenous seeds and seed-saving practices. And the seeds are for crop cultivation, but also for rituals that most often take place in sacred natural sites. And, and these sites are natural places of great ecological, cultural and spiritual significance to the community. And they're considered to be critical to the health and resilience of the earth as a whole. So spiritual leaders within the community will perform rituals in these sites to maintain equilibrium and balance in the territory. So when indigenous seed is revived, so too are the rituals and so too is the will of the community to protect sacred natural sites and their sacred relationship with nature. Um, and at this stage, discussions will often begin to focus on the laws that govern human behavior in the sacred natural sites and in the wider territory. And I share this to suggest that sacred relationships with nature can be recovered. Um, and, but to round up now, um, as Thomas Berry developed his philosophy of earth jurisprudence, he had two key sources of inspiration. So he looked to nature, which he very much understood to be sacred and of which he understood humans to be an integral part. And he also looked to indigenous worldviews. And this was the foundation of his vision. But his vision was that humans across the world uh, reestablish a mutually enhancing presence as part of the earth community. So he understood this transformation to be the work of every single one of us and and he said that intimacy with the planet and its wonder and beauty and the full depth of its meaning is what enables an integral human relationship with the planet and I think it's for us in our different ways as individuals as communities to step into that relationship one of wonder or uh, perhaps even reverence and for that relationship to be the grounding and the orientation for our future actions. <clears throat> Thanks, Carlotta. And how has it, um, how has that worked? Because you were saying that's happened in the kind of community context. Um, has that rubbed up against um, institutions or legal structures in those countries? Or have they, has it been able to work within that framework? Or has there not been that interaction yet? Well, the different communities are at different stages. So sometimes they're sort of beginning with farming and, and seeds and some of them reach a point where they're working on their laws. And although these laws are kind of traditionally oral, um, they uh, might get to a stage where they decide that they want to duck document these laws and with one community that we're working with in Uganda and um, the local district council became very enthused by this process um, and so there, there's the possibility that some of these indigenous laws may um, be implemented through local legislation so that's an example of how two, two very different uh, legal systems are somehow finding some sort of uh, point of connection. And of course, in, in Africa, many of the countries are plurilegal. So they have uh, 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 state law, which uh, is, is often the, the product of uh, colonization. And then they have the customary laws, which predate the state law by by centuries um, and constitutions will recognize customary laws as, as well as national and constitutional law. So that there, there is this space for the two to, to coexist, but, but of course they are very different. So that, that is a, that is a careful dance. 
Thanks, Carla. So that's that's super inspiring to hear and perhaps um, some encouragement for how how things could develop over time in the UK if there start to be communities of practice and how they might um, perhaps in, um, help influence the legal um, system. But in any case, the fact that these are happening in different parts of the world and um, when, in the case of Tom and Sperry's words, people are starting from different places. And, and so there is that possibility of cultures being able to develop and grow and then other cultures being able to learn and adapt in whatever way suit them so um yeah really inspiring to hear so lara um could you tell us a little bit more about the uh, work that you've been doing um with communities um and how on, on rights of nature issues and how what the responses you've had have been yes um i guess the first community i engaged with the rights of nature was actually the one i grew up with uh, I grew up in a rural area in, in the south of Catalonia. It's the area where the river that we call Ebre, it uh, melts into the sea. And it's a, um, yeah, uh, it's a place in which for the last 20 years, there's been a very strong activism grassroots movement to protect the river and uh, the area um, as the government was repeatedly trying to pass a law to transfer the water from the river to the metropolitan area, which would really threaten the, the flow of the river and would damage the, the whole ecosystem. But well, that's um, where I come from. And then last year with Convex, we had the opportunity to create a, a piece of work, a performance for Totally Thames. As I mentioned, and uh, at Convex, our work is, is often uh, based on on rights, uh, defending some kind of uh, civil rights or, or presenting issues that are hidden normally from the public eye. And we, when we had the opportunity to work with Totally Thames on something that would relate to the, totally, to the Thames um, and, and thinking what, how can we approach it, we, we started researching on river rights. Um, and then, yeah, is when we found out how as Paul and Carlota have mentioned, how indigenous communities in, in various places in the world, Colombia, uh, New Zealand and India made very tangible and relevant achievements on protection law of their rivers. And we wondered about the power of this deep connection between culture and, and nature and uh, how this is the key or sounds like is a bit of a key for protecting entire ecosystems. Um, yeah, so then with this idea of, of being very aware of these uh, communities and these spiritual uh, connections to nature and looking at the Thames and looking at Londoners, uh, the, the wide London community and how we, how, how do we relate to the Thames? What's our, um, what's our relationship? What's, uh, what do we, uh, how can we care for a river? All um, many questions that we were wondering to, to create this piece. Um, so then what we did is um, uh, to create a series of workshops uh, during the creation process of the performance. And we invited to those uh, workshops uh, people from the, the Indian communities, the Maori, the Colombian and other volunteers that uh, were interested in the theme. And we facilitated the series of creative activities that led to reflect and discuss about the following questions. Uh, so the questions were, what words do you associate with your river? And with your river, we meaning the river that you feel more connected to. Um, what does your river need? Uh, how can you care for your river? How does the river make you feel? Um, yeah, then after this discussion, um, these, these responses were integrated very much into the performance. And um, I think it would be a bit too much to, to share a lot, but I would like to share uh, some of the responses to the question of what does the river need, as is a more nature-centered question rather than anthropocentric. So we are really asking someone to be on the skin or the water of the, of the river and feel what what are the needs of the river. So some of the answers were freedom, no enslaving rights. The river needs attention, love, awareness, to flow a voice, cleaning, litter picking, campaigning, prayers, guardians, restoration, accountability, stories, narrative, legal protection. Um, so um, 
And then we presented the performance in the in the Total Attempts in London, inviting the wider London community on a meditative ritualistic walk along the Thames in, in the area of Rotherhite. Um, the, the whole performance was um, encompassing singing to the river and unveiling facts about river rights. So it was unveiling what happened with the Wanganawi River in, in um, in, in, in New Zealand and how the Maori community have this duty of care of the river. Um, what happened in India with the, with the law on 2017 and the overturning of, of that law by the central government. So during the performance while we were walking and singing, we were unveiling this, uh, these facts about river rights and making our participants aware of, uh, of the rights of, of nature concerning rivers. And the whole aim of this performance was to provoke awareness and invite Londoners to connect deeper to their local river. Um, because um, I guess that's a bit in the ethos of how we do it, how we, uh, deep, how we unveil these facts, uh, what's, what's the character it has. So the character is very much meditative, mesmerizing, uh, insightful. That was some of the feedback that we got. Uh, spiritual, magical. So everyone holding robes with with flags of facts, singing to the river, uh, being very much united and um, and connected. So that's the experience that we um, we created with Talwek. Um, yes, and then also yeah, highlighting different visions of. The relationships that that um, that you know we were pointing out about this uh, indigenous communities that have this very strong uh, relationship with with the uh, with the rivers and I think you were mentioning uh, the the Yamuna seen as a goddess in Hinduism, uh, the river Ganges uh, seen as a mother, uh, and also we engage with the um, Gati Ranana uh, Maori community in London. And one of the leaders of the community told us that his family was a direct descendant of the river. Uh, Te they call it Teawa Tupua, and yeah, it's, we're talking about the river Wanganawi. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it as well. Um, then uh, I found very interesting as well when we were speaking to someone before doing uh, the performance, but on the creation process, and we were speaking to someone on the Western society about, about river rights, about uh, personhood status of rivers, uh, about someone saying they are the descendant of the river. And I think everyone feels quite surprised and even, even shocked and thinking, how is that working? Because as a culture, we are alienated from nature and we we see nature as a thing to enjoy rather than being in, in the same whole um, system. When And I think when you start to relate things uh, more deeply, like you think, okay, uh, I, I am 60% of water, I drink water from the Thames, maybe I'm a descendant of the Thames in some way, uh, right? So then, but then we had the, um, yeah, I wanted to share a bit the feedback also on on Tawek. Um, so people who participated in that experience, they said that they felt um, very much connected to nature. They said that they never felt more connected to a river before. They said that it was meditative, insightful, spiritual, magical. And yeah, we value this very positively because um, yeah, we think to bring awareness in, a, in an embodied way and in a feeling this spiritual connection as well is, is a very important first step towards then direct action that we were mentioning as well in, in, in another talk. Um, yeah, um, can I point out to some to, to previous question to the... Yeah, sure, if you wanted to, to make a comment on, um, on something someone had said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, about the question that we were talking about the desacralization of, of nature and um, and other things and and i think you know i'm as an artist i'm very interested in what role the creative arts can play in enhancing this this um yeah this connection with with nature so um i i really relate that very strongly um with um what we have lost as a western society in the desacralization of nature and what creative arts bring 
because um, I think creative arts bring something from the sacred world that we have lost, and that is ritual that was also mentioned by Carlota as one of the things that keep the connection strong in the indigenous communities. Um, but when we are part of, of a performance, we take part in a ritual, and that brings us a feeling of belonging, and that is a collective embodied and spiritual experience, and that brings us to celebrate, to honor, and to acknowledge something in more depth that we would normally do on our daily lives. So that's why I think that the creative arts, are, when they are articulating their rituals around nature, have really the power to bring back this sacred element uh, to a society that has lost it. Well, thanks so much, Laura, for bringing in that that other aspect, which uh, Carlotta was also speaking to, that is inherent to the cultures which see themselves as part of a natural system. It involves myth, it involves jewelry, it involves ritual, and and the ways that you've been exploring bringing that back to London, which is in some ways a microcosm of the wider world. You were able to find representatives of of indigenous communities in London where these changes have been made, but also with the with the river in London and Londoners' connection and ways of developing that. So thanks so much for sharing that. Then we come to our final um, panel question, which is for Shivali. And um, I, I wanted to ask Shivali, do you think um, humans are basically wired to be at their happiest and healthiest if they see themselves or if they're connected as part of a wider natural ecosystem? What are, what are your views on that? Thanks, Gita. Um, so I think the kind of time we're living in now has, has uh, shown us um, the answer to that question. Um, a recent survey showed that 9% of Brits wanted to return to their normal life, so to speak, um, and things like we're seeing now cleaner air, we're spending less money, we're engaging more community-based or family-based activities, and it's, it's quite attractive, it seems. And um, so I guess this is one of the greatest gifts of the pandemic. Um, one podcast I was listening to that actually describes coronavirus as um, climate change or on steroids, um, because I guess it's showing us this kind of deep consequence of our disregard for the environment, but also the opportunities that it presents um, at a much faster rate than, than what the climate issues um, are going to show. Um, and I guess the opportunity part is the, is the part we need to strongly emphasize um, because climate change offers the possibility to imagine a life close to what makes us healthier and, and happier. Um, and during the pandemic, a lot of us were turning more to our green spaces um, on the first weekend of lockdown in the UK. Snowden saw its highest number of attendees in history. Um, and areas with higher pollution have also been shown to have poor outcomes from coronavirus. So, you know, who doesn't want cleaner air, more nurturing, community-centric environment, eating fresh foods? Um, and we know kind of the threats are massive. And of course, all of this feels obvious and we want to create a more wholesome environment for our next generation. But I guess the question is kind of what is holding us back? And I suppose that's what I wanted to focus on a little bit more. Now, coming from a health background, I, I guess some of my best examples come from that. And as Paul said, how law comes from a human-centric approach, medicine is, is not any different in that respect. Um, medicine was always a huge colonizing, colonizing force across the world. Um, for example, knowledge on infectious, infectious disease was superior to anywhere else in the world, and infectious disease was always the biggest killer in history. So from that, um, Western medicine was obviously more superior and built upon that. Um, so it's always been built by this kind of human-centric approach of doing everything that's absolutely possible rather than prizing sufficiency of care. Um, so in this context, we could argue that we are therefore not acting to make humans healthier or happier, but we are only arguing. We're sorry. We're only acting to make humans healthier and happier, but not necessarily um, taking into account the environment. Um, the second challenge is the number of industries that obviously we have built um, now, from the pharmaceutical industry um, to um, the food industry. Um, Dan also posted one question about that, and. Um, I guess we kind of pose them as these kind of big bad industries, but behind these industries are just people kind of, you know, I suppose like you and me, they're trying to get by, look after their families. And, and there's a huge kind of emotional investment involved in that. So unpicking all of that is, is hugely complicated. Um, and I guess third is the, the COVID-19 response relied on this huge 
global collective effort and that was only possible because we have this complexity of societies to support our health systems and ultimately this is driven by money and taxation so we've kind of built up these very complicated societies and trying to unpick that having this community-based way of living is going to be more challenging because there are certain sacrifices that we're going to have to make um are we happy to prize kind of okay that's that's enough care for for myself i don't need any further medical care would we be okay with that kind of health system these are kind of difficult questions that we are going to ask ourselves um and obviously human beings are also not known for making decisions to necessarily increase happiness um one could argue that as hunter gatherers out in the wild we were more engaged with our environment than working in factories um but we prized having control over our environment over kind of freedom to roam out in the wild um and that control has led to destruction of many communities um indigenous communities um which were less demanding of the environment so i guess the simple answer to your question is yes kita we obviously are happier and healthier um if we're more connected but it's also about per- personal and collective desire do we envision a world where we want everybody to live well and have a bit or do we want a, a very few to live very well um and so far we can see see with the number of billionaires in the world we, we are we're kind of not prepared to always make those sacrifices um but to end on a hopeful and positive note i think coronavirus has made us see that behavioral change is possible rapidly and globally um and governments can also make those changes um of of course the unknown is difficult um and it's going to require strong leadership um but individually and collectively we can make those changes um and i guess forums like this are a great places to inspire and encourage that um just to follow up on that that the, so many well not so many but a number of diseases we've seen have come from ecosystem destruction so coronavirus is one of them but it's not by any means the first and it may not be the last um do you see that at some point leading to the health profession becoming more engaged on issues like um eco ecosystem destruction or perhaps society more broadly starting to factor that in that even a small group of people can't be immune from from wider um environmental impacts um i would say kind of well from a medical journal perspective this is always something that they've been tuned in tuned into especially kind of epidemiology public health um professionals as you're seeing right now they have always been advocating obviously to they shut the borders early all of these kind of changes um and for example with coronavirus it was always it came down to the fact that um wild animals were put in contact with human beings that probably wasn't meant to happen and this is increasingly going to happen with um you know as we destroy the habitats and environment so this is something that health professionals are very aware of um but obviously we can only give the advice and and present the science and it's the policy makers and governments that need to implement those changes and that's where the difficulty lies thanks so um now i'm going to move on to a, a, our, my our final question to our panel um but before i do that it's just a reminder to all of you that please could you um type your questions in for our panel if you haven't already done so do that um now so that we have them for the breakout and if you would like to join the breakout could you please raise your hand um so that's if you would like to join the breakout um so i'm going to start with um chivali for our for our question for our final Our reflections from our panel before we go into our breakout um and that's just to ask you to talk a little bit about your your personal relationship um with nature and and how does that impact your life and and what you what you do in the world um sure just want to can you hear me properly just uh, yeah. yeah that's fine okay um so i i guess i i i don't think i have enough time with nature i think um Dogs spend the vast majority of their time in a overheated artificially lit ward and um I suppose that's how your that's your training and that's how you know you kind of work as well um and now as an editor working in office now in an apartment in London um so I try and visit nature as much as I can and I'm okay. grateful that your mic is crackling a little bit so I'm not oh, sure okay. if you have your headphone let me yeah. try this is that better yeah great thank okay. you um so I guess it, it's about visiting 
um, the nature as much as I can. And I'm grateful that, you know, the communities that I'm part of um, kind of have nature at the heart of its practice. Um, for example, I, there's a beautiful community in Hungary. Um, they're completely off the grid and um, self-sufficient with over you know, 50 different types of fruits and vegetables. And they don't rely on any kind of external source. Um, and there's one key text and we, one key quote that sticks with me actually is that um, how we should be relating to nature in that a wise person should see all tiers of society and all varieties of animals and even small organisms with equal vision. And this really draws me back to the point of what is important and how we're deeply connected, not just to each other, but the environment, animals and everything in between. And we have a great number of resources, but we're also deeply vulnerable in that. And as we've seen again from the pandemic, unfortunately, like many of us, um, I'm become a Swiss city dweller and um, we just end up craving the natural world rather than living in it. Um, and it's a state that many of us have come to be in. And I guess the problem that we have as the cities is where the jobs are, where the energy lies. And that in itself is it maybe an addiction of some sort. So I try to disconnect every year by attending some sort of retreat because I realize how important this is. Um, and I'm grateful that there are so many of us who realize the importance of that, trying to make that shift in our lives. And collectively we can kind of shift that kind of mentality, um, whether it's planting more trees or um, going out into the environment more. But it's something that's uh, always a work in progress for me. Thanks, Shivani. I've just seen that there are some comments in the um, chat box about how you raise your hand. So if you go to the participants list, you click on that, you'll see that there's a symbol and you can put the raised hand symbol. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that. Um, and so continuing in reverse order, Laura. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, I'm now looking at my window and in a way I'm very grateful that I can see a lot of green. And if I actually look at the other side as well. So I think there's something in London that also maybe as me coming from another country in which cities that I've lived like Barcelona don't have really um, those amazing green spaces or back gardens or, or just space to breathe that is not concrete. So it feels very something that I really, really appreciate um yeah and and then yeah of course that's very much uh, part of my well-being um we also um you know do some gardening and and <laughs> also as a bit of a way um you know investigating a bit of on permaculture investigating a bit on on i think it's an on life going <clears throat> ongoing life research to to think about building a, a more sustainable life, even in a place like London at the moment. I think you have to accept also the place you are. And, and of course, think about um, think about what that means and, and what you really need from a place or what the, what the place, how can you contribute to a place, um, this kind of dual relationship. Um, so I think it's, it's a life research as, as well in many aspects also as as Shivali was pointing in this coexistence of, of species and and how you acknowledge the different uh, um, organisms and animals and species and plants and and every and as much the, the deeper you look and the the more you look the more fascinating it is and the more you you respect and you want to know more and 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 protect uh, all of this, and I guess all of this really influences the the kind of routines and decisions that you that you do on your daily life, how you consume, how you shop for food, how do you work, how you travel, how you relate to others. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it's part of my personal and professional research uh, this relationship with nature. Thanks so much, Laura, and that's really important. I think that that melding of the that also Paul spoke to earlier, the melding of the personal and the professional. Are we at a point where those two things have to be in sync for the sake of the, the planet, if not ourselves? Um, Carlotta. Um, OK, I think it's Paul next, but I'm happy to corrupt the order. Oh, no, it is me. Sorry, uh -uh. <laughs> I'm wrong. 
Excuse me. Um, okay, my personal relationship with the more than human world. Um, yeah, I, it's a relationship I've been trying to deepen over the past uh, 10 years or so. Um, so I'm from inner city London. Um, but around 10 years ago, I began engaging with community food growing in urban community gardens in London. Uh, and also I would go off and woof in rural eco communities in Wales and, and Scotland um, and England. Um, and actually a year after qualifying as a lawyer, I decided I would throw it all in and be a food grower. So for a year and a half, I was at Schumacher College and I was growing food there. And that's where I met Gita. Um, and I think that growing food and tending to land is a really um, good way to re-establish a relationship with the rest of the natural world. And for me, it was really nourishing on a lot of levels and also just fabulous to be embodied and outside after many years at a desk, sitting down and staring at a screen. Um, but I'm a bit more desk based these days. Um, and I'm not growing food, I don't have access to land, but I do a lot of foraging for wild herbs, which you might call weeds. Um, but most days I go out and I forage and I have some favorite spots that I really get to know. And I pick herbs for teas, for salads. I have a daily green smoothie. Uh, so today I had one with a lot of nettles. Um, and yeah, I think in the context of the pandemic and the lockdown, actually, where there's less interspecies, uh, sorry, interhuman interaction, there's so much more space I'm finding for interspecies interaction. So um, I'm communing with plants and noticing birds uh, and, and, and relating to trees in a, in a kind of much more present way than, than I would have done, I think, were it not for this pandemic period. Um, and in terms of other personal practices, well, as part of our Earth Jurisprudence trainings, we do uh, sit spots. We have a regular practice of choosing a space in nature nearby. And that could be, you know, I use that nature loosely. It could be a park or, or a tree nearby your house. And you just develop a relationship with that place and you return regularly and you go and you sit there and you simply observe, um, or in the words of Colin Campbell, who leads some of our wilderness immersion, um, the wilderness immersion component of our trainings, um, and I know he's spoken at an Advaya event as well, uh, you, you render yourself pervious to nature, and, and in so doing, actually, it's amazing uh, what can happen, so I really recommend that, and as, as well as sit spots, we also spend lo longer periods in nature. I've been fortunate to do a, a night vigil in a wilderness area with some of our practitioners, and that is a process that, that should be whole, held. So I don't recommend going off and doing one of those alone. Um, but again, that was, that's really prompted a very powerful shift for me in moving from this sense of nature as a collection of objects and out there to being very much part of a communion of, of subjects. And um, so, yeah, those are some of my personal practices. Oh, that sounds wonderful and I think I'll be in touch for wild foraging tips and smoothie yeah. making tips too so that just sounds sounds great and Paul can we um yeah so I have recently when I've been doing tree work I've been sort of trying to I suppose change the way in which I perceive what I'm doing so actually seeing the trees as my clients a bit more which I think many of my colleagues would see as quite mad but it's actually very satisfying um, especially as in a lot of times I'm not getting paid for this work. So um, it's uh, it's nice to build up a relationship with that tree. And there's recently a, a tree up in North London called the Happy Man Tree, which is being threatened. I was giving them some advice. Um, and after everyone else left, I sort of had a little moment with myself and hugged the tree and sort of put my hand on it and sort of spoke to it and said that it was an honour to help protect it and to represent it. And um, yeah, that kind of feeling is really magical and makes it all worthwhile. And actually I did the first kind of um, uh, uh, more badass activism this week and I actually climbed the tree to occupy it and they're trying to chop it down, uh, which is quite fun. Um, but um, the main way I connect with nature is through water, I think. Um, and I've lived on a boat for eight years. Um, and three years ago I moved to the River Roding in East London, which is an abandoned river. Effectively, no one lived in it. It was, no one was doing anything with it. It was just in a very sorry state. Um, and set up a community of boaters to try and restore it 
And I guess this is kind of a practical example of what I was talking about earlier, that, you know, that the river roading doesn't have rights. Um, and if we try to get them passed, they would laugh at us. But actually, effectively, we are now, our group of voters is kind of upholding the rights of the river, um, both in practical terms. You know, we um, do a lot of litter picking and planting trees and um, looking out for wildlife and seeing what's going on in the river. Also in the sense of like, I think other people alluded to it, when a river, when, when, you, when you give an intention of love, I suppose, to a place, it kind of, it reflects in that place. Um, but also in very much in um, legal ways as well. So for instance, I found out a couple of weeks ago, there's actually a thing called a litter abatement order and that anyone can apply for if an area is full of litter. So one of the rights we'd want to have for nature is, especially rivers, is to remove rubbish, right? Um, but we're not going to get Parliament to pass that law, but they already have. It's in the Environment Act 1990. You just write to the authority who's supposed to be in charge of it and say, remove this rubbish by this date or we'll get an order to stop making you do it. So I've already written that letter to the person who's supposed to be in charge of it. Um, and also, I suppose, as well, trying to foster that relationship between local people and their river and make it into a more sacred space. Um, and I think, yeah, for me... It, seeing nature as sacred and as reverential has been a, a huge has been I suppose the precursor to the work that I'm now doing and I think that's the most important part so for all of you to connect with nature I suppose go to nature go to your rivers go to your trees treat them as sacred and then work out how you can practically practically manifest that because you all can everyone can and that's what really makes a difference and who knows one day we might get an act of parliament for the river roading but in the meantime, no one is gonna no one is gonna mess with her uh, while our little group of boaters are there because we love her. Yeah, and that's what we need. Hopefully, at some point, you or someone who has that feeling will become a judge, and then that's how <laughs> <laughs> changes. I, 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 I think I think I'm too much of a loose cannon to become a judge. <laughs> Oh, you know, well, you yeah, know, that's absolutely key, though, as you're saying, it's it's and um, just to in the sake of for the sake of full disclosure, because you've all done that, I will, I'll mention a little bit, too, that um, I, I wrote a, a blog after I left Friends of the Earth about my local port park and it was kind of a slightly tongue in cheek title of late nature as a life coach. And it was about how much it helped me sort of go through what felt like burnout and what I learned from just taking park walks. And I was really astonished by the level of response of people telling me about their favorite trees or their favorite connection or how much their local parks meant to them. And I thought, this is really, really common. Like everyone does it, but no one ever says, no, like you're going to go and see your friend or something. You don't go and see, oh, I'm going to go and see my favorite tree or I'm going to hang out with the river I really like. You don't articulate it in those terms, but for so many people, it's, it's so powerful. So I think that's, um, that's an encouraging thing. Do you see, and so this is for Paul, do you see any other areas of our existing legal framework which are ripe for setting new precedents that would give rise to rights that protect nature? Um, and which was related to Ian's question, um, which was asking if Parliament's net zero 2050 law that was introduced last year was something to be hopeful about. Okay, Paul, and I know that, of course, you're a civil lawyer, so this isn't technically your field um, and so of course you know do do go ahead and if I can help out on anything I will. <laughs> uh, yeah so the Heathrow decision was a really good one um, and um, there are potential other uses for it um, that was actually done um, the Heathrow decision there were multiple parties to it and um, it was Friends of the Earth but also a group called Plan B which is basically one guy and his assistant um, and it was the plan B line of argument that actually won out in the end and has potentially massive ramifications for, um, for uh, the way our legal system deals with climate change um, and uh, how that impacts upon infrastructure, planning, lots of different things. So um, I think that's a good lesson that you can change things even if you're small. Um, uh, but for me, that's, uh, I guess, on a bit of a, that's on a, a rather large scale and I'm much more interested in the small scale actions of ordinary people uh, taking on the protection of nature in the area and I think there's a legal ecosystem perhaps of all different people acting in different ways and you need the plan b's and the client earths and everyone else but you also need the people at the bottom supporting those who are 
uh, directly protecting nature and that's where I guess my real interest lies. Absolutely and that you know you as you say you need that strategic litigation but you need people on the ground this is this is everyone connecting and protecting their their local areas and every area is important as every other. Also on one one fun thing that occurs to me as well is that we need to be careful as well of course how we um, deal with carbon and climate versus nature so for instance hs2 is actually really carbon intensive um for various reasons but imagine it wasn't imagine if hs2 would save carbon does that then justify um smashing through loads of ancient forests and actually we're going to see i think more and more over the next few years many solutions to climate change which are actually going to be very destructive of nature and this is some of the hoo-ha that happened around the planet of the humans recently it was not a good film that bad angle to take on it but that's that kind of question of um, in solving climate change and in, in reducing carbon, are we forgetting about the protection of nature more broadly? Or even worse, are we actually making it worse? Or are we destroying nature in order to reduce carbon? Yeah, and that really speaks to what we, what you've been saying, uh, the other panellists in our previous session, which is the real key importance of an integrated approach and not trying to split off one thing, um, but trying to see it in that holistic way that is um, solving a number of problems together. Great, thanks, Paul. Our next question, please, Ruby. Um, so this question, I can't remember who asked it, but it was for both Shivali and Paul. Um, and it was asking, do you think that there is legal precedent for prioritisation of public health over economic growth now that global governments have unanimously agreed on it? Can we use these definitions of climate change as a public health threat to build a case against it? Um, uh, Shivali, do you want to start on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I've got a, a brief reply on this. Um, so already um, you know, certain NHS trusts have actually recognised um, that we should declare climate change as a public health emergency and this was declared and um, there has been adv advocacy around um, encouraging other big health organisations to do this similarly. Um, for instance, the World Health Organisation and the BMJ has been quite vocal on that um, since quite early on. Um, so short answer to that, yes. Um, I think um, health should be backing that. I think with obviously the, the scientific background and um, obviously people respect health professionals and their, their opinions. So we should use that position to um, promote that. Paul? Cool. Uh, I'm not sure something I'm an expert enough in to give a reasoned answer on, I think. So I will defer to Shivali. Sure. Uh, next question, please, Ruby. Um, this was from Kat. What is the relationship between the legal rights of nature movement and the existing human rights fra framework? Um, sorry, I read that wrong. What is the relationship between the legal rights of nature movement and the existing human rights framework? framework are they compatible or is the human rights framework blocking more significant change oh um well yeah i would say that uh human rights and the rights of nature are two sides of the same coin so for instance you have the human right to to life to to clean water in many many jurisdictions to a healthy environment and for me it's a nonsense to have those rights and not to have the rights of of nature to to exist and and to um function and and, and to flourish um, because we derive our, our life and our food and our water um and our health uh, from the earth uh, that that's primary so um, yeah, I think it's a nonsense to have the human rights framework without the rights of nature. And interestingly, the current UN Special Rapporteur on human rights, uh, Dr. David Boyd, he has also written a book on the rights of nature. And he, at the moment, he's doing a study on uh, the human right to a healthy environment and how state parties can realise that right. And uh, I, I just, I'm submitting on the rights of nature, and I'm sure it's at the foreground of, of the, the fore of his mind as well. So, yeah, I would say that they are they are interlinked and 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 complementary. Um, I'm not aware of ways in which human rights sort of obstruct but as Paul has drawn out uh, earlier of course property rights uh, which uh, reign supreme um, in in many jurisdictions are of course in in conflict with with the yeah. rights and, of and the right to a healthy environment is actually recognized in many the vast majority of constitutions in the world and is actually a sort of bridging right because it stretches to um, 
humans benefiting from a broader ecosystem that exists, even if it's not directly related to them. So you start seeing the edging towards um, the protection of nature in a, in a framework that's considered more palatable for the existing kind of approaches that we have. Um, and, and it also speaks to this question about the prioritization of, of um, health over economics. So there is a human right to health. And, you know, that gets weighed against other things as, as human rights generally are. But there's potentially ways in around that about how are you prioritizing these things. Um, Paul, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say, like, actually, the, I think how the weakness of human rights in many ways is a, is a bit of a instructive parable for how we want to be careful about pinning all our hopes on some sort of tablet of nature rights handed down from parliament on high like in most practical senses the human rights act is actually not that useful um because all of the rights pretty much are um you uh, are relative rights so they can you can justify infringement so yeah e everyone has a right to freedom of speech except when the law says you don't and the law is basically what you know whatever the prevailing social current says it is um e even absolute rights like the right to life right the state can't take away your life but yeah the state can can knowingly permit air pollution to be such dangerous levels that it kills 40,000 people a year. I mean, a lot of the time I, I find human, even when I'm having to argue protesters, nature protection protesters' rights through the Human Rights Act, even their right, rights to freedom of speech are just bunk. I mean, really, it's, it's, the, the Human Rights Act offers very little additional protection, I find. Um, and, you know, people's right to a home is always trumped by property rights, which are also helpfully included in a protocol, which the judges are very appreciative of, because it means they can continue to uphold system they've been upholding for about 800 years. Yeah. So that's why I think we should be so careful of, of hoping that we just get an act of parliament, the Nature Rights Act 2025 passed, and that will solve all our hopes, because without people on the ground enforcing those rights and acting for nature, I don't think it would necessarily mean that much. Yeah. Yep, and just for the sake of clarity, we don't have a right to health environment in the UK, so you can only ever try and bring environmental issues into the human rights context by sort of difficult, convoluted ways. <laughs> um, we had the follow-up question I know Ruby was saying about the precautionary principle, so I don't know if either you, Carlotta or Paul, wanted to, to speak to that. Um, it's a little bit technical, so perhaps we don't want to go into too much detail, but it's it's the idea that you you don't wait for full information about the harm and scientific information about the harm to, in order to be able to take action on it. Um, and it's in a lot of international instruments. It's not really part of UK law directly, so it's a little bit convoluted. Perhaps that's enough to say about it, actually, because unless either of you wanted to say anything more on that, because otherwise it does get a little bit technical. I'm, I'm seeing that neither of you... Um, no, I won't uh, go into technicalities. I just want to pick up on a point that Paul has raised because I think it is really important to bring out in this conversation and it hasn't come out much yet, which is, you know, as Paul has said, r the recognition of the rights of nature, it's not a magic bullet. It's not a point of arrival. In fact, it's the very beginning. It's kind of a step on the journey. And we haven't really talked about the specifics of how the rights of nature have been recognised in different jurisdictions. Of course, we don't really have time to go into those details. But I think I, we should say that, in fact, there's been a limited implementation um, in, in some countries like Bolivia, where there's this robust and beautifully worded uh, national law. Um, to my knowledge, there's never been a case in which rights of nature have, have been effectively enforced. That's different in, in Ecuador, um, where there is jurisprudence building, but that's taking time. Um, and in New Zealand, um, yeah, there's, so there's personhood is recognised, but again, there haven't been any cases. And, and I think that, that that reflects in part that this is a very kind of novel uh, sort of shift in, in our legal framework and there's a question of education and the legal community having property law kind of hardwired um, and, and not being very receptive or able to understand how the rights of nature might interrelate with uh, property rights, for example, and what the hierarchy of rights is. But, but it also reflects the fact that law doesn't uh, operate in a political or economic uh, vacuum. And in fact, you know, we have an economy and a, 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 a sort of political global regime uh, which is really uh, kind of based on on the the disrespect of the rights of nature in that it's all it's based on the commodification of nature so we have quite a hostile economic and political context uh, you, you know it's difficult for for rights of nature to to take root so so it's the beginning of the journey but but certainly i wouldn't claim that it's a magic bullet and i think it's good that 
Paul has drawn brought that up. Great, thank you. Ruby, could we have the next question, please? Yeah. All of the panelists spoke of the importance of personal relationships with nature to inspire and create a desire to protect it, which I imagine is something most of the people here tonight share. How can we encourage people who don't feel connected to the natural world or for whom it does not feel so inherent to discover or foster that relationship? Great. So who would like to speak with that? Perhaps, uh, Laura, we haven't heard from you yet. So any thoughts on that? Uh, Laura, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I think, um, yes, as you pointed, it's, it's, um, it's quite easy to draw people in who are already interested in, in the topic or who um, already have some kind of connection and you bring them a bit to a deeper level or you just, you know, spread a bit, you know, the word on, on the campaigns or activities or performances or activism um, on things that people can get engaged. Um, so I think it's about doing, you know, proposing things and then and sometimes targeting as well. Um, we are finding as well with, with comics is very it's very important that we also um, target who who we can reach as well that that they are not maybe in our immediate reach and and that's a bit of research and a bit of um, of uh, of connections and and building a bit of a network um so i think that's my thoughts on that thoughts from others Um, it's a very difficult question, um, you know, it, it, I think we're amongst uh, people seeing from the same hymn sheet at the moment. Um, um, I, I kind of, coming back to kind of the health professional circle, um, the approach that we've taken is that you have to speak in a language that they understand. So communicating climate change to health professionals, so we've tried to bring the language of disease and pathology it, because that's what we understand that's how we're trained that's how our brains unfortunately work um, so when you communicate messages in that way that's proven more successful um, with health professionals than if you try and talk about polar bears and ice caps um, so I think we're all kind of placed in our unique communities to understand those people in our lives and how to communicate those messages and it takes a lot of patience in, sometimes but um and just finding those small ways of um, tapping into that. Um, I would say uh, food growing with people. I've done a lot of community food growing with people with varying levels of interest. And, uh, you know, it brings people a, lo a lot of joy. We all eat food. Most of us really enjoy food. And um, getting our hands in the soil, there were some comments earlier about uh, this, the 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 chemicals in the soil that sort of really infuse us with with a sort of feel good uh, factor and um, I have seen it to be really powerful for people you know in, in fact you don't have to do very much nature does its work um, so I would really recommend um, uh, engaging with people uh, on food growing and there are so many community gardens in in London and, and across the world uh, and also I have found uh, I often run into people when I'm foraging and they see me picking linden tree leaves and beech leaves and all sorts of crazy things and, and kind of say you know often people will engage me and say you know what are you doing and why and I start saying well I'm picking this because and this is how I eat it this is what I do with it and uh, you know people will join me and they'll sort of try things and again it's just really uh, you know I spend it's just a really nice antidote to rather than trying to kind of intellectualize again you just you step back and 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 the rest of the natural world just works upon people and and again sit spots encouraging people to do sit spots as well um and just being outside yeah. it's a joy um Carter, could you just sort of clarify what exactly is a sit spot when you sit and spend time in a, in a space 
Yeah, so uh, so it could be anywhere outside in a naturalish environment, but you know, an urban park or or a garden or or anywhere. And you might go there, you know, every day for twenty minutes. You make a commitment and and you sit there and uh, you 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 just open yourself to the space. You observe. Some people like to bring a journal. Some people just sit there and over that that period of, of visiting regularly you begin to build a relationship with 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 the place and uh, uh i know um this is not where i get it from but for instance john young talks about these sit spots and there are lots of nature connection processes that use some sort of variation of, of a sit spot and i would also reckon recommend an um, emergence magazine which does a lot of looks at ecology and, and and spirituality and they have along with lots of beautiful articles by wonderful writers they also have a section on practices and they have uh practices which are not kind of expressly termed as sit spots but sort of for instance how you build a relationship with a tree so I, th I think um very simple very powerful in in my experience and open to everyone thanks Carlotta and thanks for mentioning the food growing I potted plants with tomorrow with Carlotta and it has been a lot of fun <laughs> Paul um so I think I mentioned this in the breakout group actually that in many ways fighting for the rights of nature is actually a way that, to bring people into loving nature so actually it often works that way around when it's done on a local level so you know in many places people they ha they haven't necessarily been that involved in any kind of nature activism or anything and then they suddenly see their tree being chopped down or their river being polluted and it brings it sort of radicalizes them i think maybe positive radicalization if we can put it that way and sheffield is now in many ways a hotbed of quite a lot of environmental action because of the campaign you see this and actually, it's a great way to engage people who might not otherwise be engaged. I was outside the Happy Man Tree earlier this week, and um, I could hear the protesters talking to people going by, and they just talked like local lads who normally, presumably, wouldn't care. And they're like, they want to chop the tree down. And they're like, well, why would they want to do that, mate? You know, it's just kind of like, and actually, the, you can see them getting into it a little bit. Um, that's one way. The other thing I've been actually involved in is um, with some sort of uh, former left-wing comrades, uh, as it were, um, who are a bit disenchanted with ordinary left-wing politics and looking at the idea of the politics of enchantment. So what it means to actually be enchanted with something and how that would actually reflect in politics. And we came up with had a sort of brainstorming session with some MPs about ideas for connecting people with nature more. And my friend came up with one, which is like, give everyone a, uh, give every 16 year old a free rail car to travel around England and actually see the country that, that belongs to them. And then another one that I really like is to um, every major event registered with the state, so birth, marriage, death, you'd get a tree to commemorate that. And then you'd have to therefore have community forests in which to plant that tree. So everyone would have a tree to commemorate certain events. And particularly for the births, right, if every child has a tree that's their tree, um, I think it'll actually connect them with nature because they, they want to protect that tree. Hopefully that extends to other trees, you know. So that would be my crazy idea. Mm -hmm crazy at all and, and thanks for bringing the activist element because of course it's really important to engage with the wider system that we're around so that we continue to have nature to enjoy. Uh, Ruby, um, you have a further question? Um, another question um, was what tips could you give to help make a new nature connection project for young people in the UK truly accessible and attractive for young black, Asian and minority ethnic people? Okay, um, anyone on our panel have thoughts on that? Um, I guess a, a few things. Um, I suppose the main, well, the main one really is that um, people have to be able to see um, themselves and their leaders and their role models that they're looking up to, and particularly in the climate and environment space. Um, I think this is, a, this is a something I've come up quite a few times that um, often the, there isn't that representation and um, this, this is not just the environment but across many different things. Um, so engaging young people, that, I suppose that's one way, having those role models there in place. Um, and also it's kind of what, what interests them. I can't, it kind of comes back to my point before, you, you have to know kind of in what language and what kind of um, way to speak to them. And having an understanding of that, um, I think, is 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 important. Thanks, Shivani. Anyone else got any thoughts on this particular question? 
And of course, it's worth, you know, bearing in mind flagging again that a lot of, you know, people from ethnic minorities, myself and Shivali included, come from cultures where there is a very inherent connection with nature which still exists. So it's, it's um, you know, worth bearing that in mind too. Um, I think we'll, if we can move on to the next question. Um, yeah. So back to legal um, structures, one question came recently um, to Paul, saying Paul mentioned property is at the heart of English common law system. Property and land is the ultimate commons that has been enclosed in the UK. How do we unlock swathes of land in the UK and elsewhere for small holdings, permaculture, agroforestry and so on? Yeah, I, I replied in the comments basically saying I think that's more of a political than a legal question uh, because you can come up all the fancy legal footwork you want but ultimately it's one of the most political issues in this country is the fact that we have one of the most concentrated systems of land ownership much of which was stolen from ordinary people and it's still in the hands of the descendants of the people who stole it and they just completely shame us about that and we just accept it <laughs> so i think it comes into this that's quite a political revolutionary question although interesting as well i mentioned the commons you know the, the few commons that weren't enclosed a lot of times that, that was parks like Hampstead Heath were originally commons and they were going to be enclosed in some the 19th century and the reason they weren't is because ordinary people literally just went and made it not happen there's a really great pamphlet called uh, I think tear down the fence or something it has a little quote where basically that people where everyone went to the pub and then they went down to the commons and then a great cry went up to tear down the fence and that's what people did and if they hadn't done that those commons would now be housing we would never have them um, and so, yeah, for me, it's another point. The commons take you straight back to uh, radical uh, direct action for local people to protect their nature. But on a more general scale of trying to do land ownership, that's just a political question. And whether the British will ever be revolutionary enough to actually redistribute their land is an open question. Mm -hmm. Big open question. Maybe um, perhaps we can take one more question. Oh, sorry, uh, Carlos, did you want to say yes, something? I just had one quick thought, but yes, it's not... Uh, it, it's just so my experience in Peckham in, in London is that um, uh, communities have approached the council and they've said, you know, we're aware that you have this land or this building, you're not using it and we have an idea for it. And what do you think we'll we'll kind of look after it? And and actually so that council were were responsive. And there, there are two great projects that I know of, a, a wonderful community food garden and also an arts project. Uh, uh, art space and um, both of which I think you know there's a minimal pay and, and they do wonderful things so it's not a radical solution but I think approaching councils and and ca can be a way of accessing land. Well, that's really positive to hear actually Carlos so that there are ways of engagement um, directly within the governance structures we have to. So maybe perhaps if we could have our final question and then I'll take some closing reflections from our panel. And well, so most, of, most of the questions have kind of been answered um, in some way, but there's one um, that was asking for more details, which was if you could share some more examples on how rights of nature work in New Zealand and Ecuador, um, places which have instilled laws already, is it effective? What are the main challenges? Carlos, I think this was something you touched on a, a little bit, and, and Paul also, but I don't know if you wanted to sort of elaborate further, either of you? Yeah, I mean, I can say a bit more and then maybe Paul. Um, yeah, so in uh, it's kind of interesting, actually, to contrast New Zealand and Ecuador, because they have different systems that sort of showcase two approaches that are taken within rights of nature. So um, in New Zealand, you have the recognition of a specific ecosystem, um, which is granted personhood. And I think there are questions around that language. It's quite anthropocentric to, to talk about personhood. And it's also in a way quite strange just to uh, to separate off an ecosystem and recognise its rights. Uh, and it's, it's not just the Wanganui River. And there you go. That's the fourth pronunciation of that. Uh, of the name we'll never know how it's pronounced um, not just the river there's also a national park as well and uh, in the case of the Wanganui River uh, personhood is is recognized and so so and, and legal guardians are uh, appointed and it's co-governance between the the Maori and the New Zealand government um, but the rights themselves are not specified within within the law uh, the law is beautifully written some of it, it recognizes the Wanganui River as a kind of indivisible metaphysical spiritual 
sort of person. Um, so it's sort of radical in, in some ways in that you don't normally find those words in law. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, it, it doesn't extinguish existing property rights. So that sort of, and, and also actually only relates to the riverbed, but not the water itself. So if you start looking a bit deeper, you can start picking holes with these laws. Um, in, in the case of uh, Ecuador, it's a constitutional law and it relates to Pachamama, nature as a whole. And, I, and, 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 and there are a whole series of rights that are specified. And Ecuador is actually, uh, the, the law is quite similar in Bolivia as well. But by contrast with Bolivia, where there haven't been any cases in Ecuador, there are now a whole series of um, cases. Um, and, and initially when they brought cases, the cases failed. And that was because they were highly, politi highly politicized national cases um, in opposition to mining. And of course, the, the government's uh, economic model is based on extractivism. So there just wasn't the political will to enforce the rights of nature. So then activists took another strategy and they started um, bringing cases, uh, local cases and sort of less politicized cases, cases that were below the ra radar and the rights of nature uh, jurisprudence began to build. Uh, judges became familiar with, with the concept and, and now actually there are some national cases as well. So that's an interesting kind of story and, and I think lesson for us and, 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 and um, it, it is encouraging, but obviously there, there's still a hell of a lot of extractivism um, going on in, in Ecuador. Um, so I hope that that is some answer. Thank you, Carlos. Anything to add on that? Um, yeah, one interesting example actually in the UK, um, the first river that was attempted to get rights for was the River Froome, and local people um, tried to put forward a bylaw um, which would enact um, rights to the river, which was rejected by central government. Surprise, surprise. Um, but actually, last week, as a postscript to this, I got contacted because um, a, a local developer is trying to destroy a waterside meadow, and local people have risen up against that. And have, uh, there's numerous petitions, and they're like lobbying the council and trying to get the plan commission rejected, and actually fighting for the rights of the river and its surrounds. So, yeah, I guess even though the actual uh, bylaw may be rejected, the fact that so many local people and friends of the River Froome exist actually acts as a protection on the river as well and they can still fight for their rights to the river regardless of that so i guess it's a positive way of saying again get involved to save your local nature sure and then on, on the point of limitations of law uh, just to finish off the story of the yamuna the the reason one of the reasons the indian supreme court rejected the case was they said we have passed judgments again and again it's a very activist court on the environmental stuff uh, front saying this river needs to flow it needs this level of minimum flow these are the things that need to happen, which the government has not ignored and has not um, implemented and creating a whole load of extra things like who, well, if the state government was arguing, well, if the river floods, who is responsible for that? You know, will we have to pay? And it raised all of these other issues, which the courts decided it didn't need to deal with because it was saying we've already tried to do this in other ways and it's not being implemented. I wouldn't say that was a full answer, but it does show that courts are trying to grapple with these issues and they can be complicated. Um, though yeah we, we do see positive movements forward as well in other jurisdictions right so we've come to um i've got a few minutes left now and i'd really love um to hear some closing reflections from each of our panel members any sort of final thoughts that you'd like to leave our um attendees with this evening everyone who's joined us uh sure i can begin um yeah, well, I think there are, you know, definitely some um, powerful things that that we can all do, and 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 it seems to have come up quite a lot that actually personal practice and personal relationship with nature is, is I think, a, a, is it's important to kind of work at, at the individual level as well as thinking about a, a change at collective and, and institutional level. And we've had some lovely ideas from from speakers on on the chat and and in the panel about how we might deepen that relationship so I'd really encourage people to do that and also to think about the language we use and whether it's earth-centered or human-centered and what kind of ideas it's entrenching and, and perpetuating and trying to introduce the rights of nature in, into popular discourse you, you see with ecocide people recognize it now and, and it would be great if people started getting their head around rights of nature as well um, and uh, yeah if you're interested in earth jurisprudence please do check out the Gaia Foundation website we have more information there on that um, and uh, also there's a petition for the UN uh, a, a proposed UN declaration of the rights of mother earth and it was drawn up in around 2010 by a 
a very international um, civil society group and, and so perhaps sign that petition. Those are some ideas um, for next steps. Great, thanks Carlotta. Perhaps we could ask our other panellists to continue in that vein with some ideas for next steps for um, our, our friends here tonight. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to end with a quote from uh, Tai Hat Nan uh, from a book that I read recently that is called Pieces Every Step and he has uh, the, the relationship with nature quite embedded in it. And that says, um, we have to meditate on being the river so that we can experience within ourselves the fears and hopes of the river. If we cannot feel the rivers, the mountains, the air, the animals, the other people from within their own perspective, the rivers will die and we will lose <clears throat> our chance of peace. Um, and then, yeah, I found it um, beautiful and inspiring. Um, on trying to to have this empathy uh, on on nature, trying to feel how the tree is feeling, feel how the river is feeling. Um, it seems like it's something we cannot do, but uh, on on a first glance. But I think it's something that if we uh, put our attention and our focus on that, we can feel that connection and that empathy that it's it's a bit of the first kind of um, um, individual steps and individual awareness that then will bring a bit of more collective awareness and and that's what as we've seen um, can trigger very very achieve yeah very relevant achievements um, also a little note that I might post on the chat the website of convex which you can in there um wait um well i will post it later because <laughs> but anyway yeah in there you can see the full video of talwek the the performance we did on the river rides and you can check out the new project we're doing now in which uh, we guide you online because of the you know in the in the whole new context we are thinking um how we can uh, evolve a bit our approach on community togetherness voices and threatened environments so we are guiding you online to, to um, be by your windows and connect to your surroundings through singing and mindfulness. You can join us this Saturday at 4 p.m. or next Saturday. And when I know how to post to everyone, I'll post uh, the website. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll be what we'll be doing. We'll, we'll be collating all these links and sending them by email anyway. So if you send them to us, Lara, we can we can send them for you. So don't worry. And thanks so much for sharing that beautiful quote and and what you're doing um, so that people can join in. If you'd like to go next out of my final two. <laughs> Shall I? Um, uh, oh, are you at the top of my, okay, go ahead. Shall I go? Yeah, I was gonna say you're at the top of my screen, so um, I'll ask <laughs> you to speak first. <laughs> um, um, sticking kind of with the, with the theme of COVID. Um, so um, for me, kind of reflecting on both COVID and rights to nature, for me, they're both global issues that are affecting everyone. They're not just somewhere over there. And um, it's made us realise that, you know, how much something that's happening in one part of the world can affect another part. And that, that's an important lesson for all of us. And, and it shows that, that climate or rights to nature are not partisan issues. They, they require everyone on board and we need to bring everyone on board to, to, to kind of, make the changes that we want to see in our in our society and we're at a strong you're going in and out sorry Shivali. sorry um and we're in a kind of we're in a stronger position now where people are starting to rethink how they want to lead their lives and they want to make those different changes so it's kind of a tipping point to enable people to start thinking differently um i was just thinking back on the question about if public health should we prioritise over economic growth, and I was a bit hesitant on this because you know econ economists would say that they are acting in favour of public health because we know the terrible outcomes that can happen if unemployment rises to sky high levels. So these are not easy black and white answers, and we're kind of treading a, a, a thin, difficult path. Um, so these are issues that I think we have to think through carefully. And um, thinking about Yamuna. Um, you know, I think often people think that the, the, you know, the reason for that is the pollution by the local people, but actually it's due to this 
global demand for rice and you can obviously read and watch the kind of movies about this and um, won't go too much into that so anyway just to bring that all together um all of these are global issues and he, we're successful as humans by our ability to cooperate so that's the one thing that should we should be capitalizing on um in this space and perhaps this could be a point of discussion for, for the future actually and the, the movie she mentioned is called the stolen river which is about the impact of Basmati growth on on the flow of the river and communities further downstream. Paul. Yeah, I just want to end with the fact that my experience of nature protection and nature rights over the last few years shows that it's really ordinary people who are willing to stand up for things that make the difference. And I fundamentally believe that um, nature rights uh, uh, really sits in all of your hands, and you can all make a massive difference. And I suppose the way to do that is to start with yourself and your relationship to nature so um go to go to nature that is special to you or local to you spend time in it grow to love it and commit yourself to it to its protection and then do what is ever is necessary within the realms of peacefulness but not necessarily within the realms of the current legal system to uphold um, the rights of that nature and to protect it and if you do that you will be massively advancing the um cause of the rights of nature and also I think uh, making your life even better. Great, that's a wonderful rousing message to send everyone off to bed with, <laughs> plotting ways to, to do that into in our own lives. So all that remains really for now for me is to um, round off the session by saying that we're, we have our final panel next week on resilience which is drawing together the threads of all of these different sessions. Um, this has been a wonderful, I was really excited about this panel and the different influences and people's knowledge and expertise coming together on this and it's really been fascinating and really want to thank our panel for all the thought and care and knowledge that they've shared with us this evening. Um, and we have a final question for you all to perhaps reflect on in the course of the week before on this, on this topic um, before we meet again next Thursday. Um, and that is, what is one thing you can do in your own life, within your communities, to have a deeper sense of our connection with nature? So we've had lots of food of thought um, from our panellists this evening, and so hopefully there's lots of ideas in there. And yeah, so all I would like to do now is perhaps we can unmute ourselves and give uh, our panel a round of applause and then um, wish you all well for tonight and a good night's rest. Right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.